Okay, it's uh, five o'clock in the UK, um, two o'clock in Australia, and Harsha, it must be 11 o'clock where you are, if I'm right. Welcome Close to this. 12. Sorry? Close, it's 12. 12. Ah, yes, I'm not in Geneva anymore. It's not six hours. So welcome to this session, Nudge to Test and Test as Nudge, Behavioral Economics and HIV Self-Testing in East and Southern Africa. Uh, we're really happy that you could all join. Um, this is a session jointly organized by all of our presenters, um, but officially organized by Jason Ong um, and myself. Um, Jason is an associate professor at Monash University, and I am a professor in health economics at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and currently serving as health economist at UNAIDS in Geneva, um, wearing two hats, which is always um, fun. This session is really aiming to think about how do we achieve the, that, that uh, 2030 goal of uh, ending the AIDS epidemic, and how do we reach those uh, the, the people that may be harder to reach or that are not well served by HIV, uh, current HIV uh, prevention and, and treatment uh, intervention. So we're really thinking about how can we use behavioral economics um, to, to, to get closer to those targets. And as we know in behavioral economics, they really aim to, um, we, we know that human behavior subconsciously are influenced by the choice architecture. And so as um, public health practitioners and health economists, we are thinking about how can we actively design the environment um, to change, um, to achieve better societal outcomes by changing the choice architecture and making doing the right things easier. So we're going to present a range of um, um, presentations um, that are aiming to, um, that'll show you a number of different approaches to designing interventions to better accommodate users and consider how HIV self-testing can be part of such strategies. Um, we have, um, I'm, my daughter decided to make noise despite it. So apologies for all the noise. This is part of working from home. Um, so we have uh, five different, six different presenters today. Um, we have invited Omar Galarga, who is a very close uh, colleague of Sandra Sosi Ruby, who was meant to be our discussant, um, but she sadly and tragically passed away between the time that we um, started, we developed this, we submitted the proposal and now. So Omar will uh, have a brief, moment to tell you about how she has influenced all of our um, work. And then we'll move on to Linda Sunday. Oh, Omar is an Associate Professor of Health Services Policy and Practice at Brown University. Um, then we'll move on to our uh, study presentations. Linda Sunday, who uh, just wave Linda, is an, a health economist at MLW in Ballantyre and has experience working across Southern Africa. And she's pursuing a PhD in the, on the equity impact of HIV self-testing on HIV testing in Malawi. Uh, second, we have Colin Mangana. If you give us a quick wave, Colin, uh, who is a health economist at the Center for Sexual Health and HIV AIDS Research in uh, Zimbabwe, and he's pursuing a PhD on economic evaluation of HIV testing in Malawi, in Zimbabwe, excuse me. We have Peach, Peach, maybe you've turned off your camera. Um, she's a research fellow and a PhD student at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine um, and has extensive experience living and working in Malawi and South Africa and has been leading a trial on um, community-led HIV self-testing, and she'll show you the results of that, the cost and cost effectiveness. The last presentation um, will be Harsha Tiramurti, who is an associate professor in, of health policy at the University of Pennsylvania, and he's also co-director of the Penn Development Research Institute. Last but not least, Matt will give us some discussion points. Uh, Matt, Matt Quaith is an assistant professor at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. So without further ado, 
I am going to hand over to Omar um, to um, tell us a bit about Sandra's work. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Fern. Um, I wish uh, I wish I didn't have to do this, but it is very kind of, of you to allow us to do this. Um, I had the pleasure of working with uh, Sandra Sosa Rubi uh, for about 15 years, uh, starting when I worked at the National Institute of Public Health. Uh, as mentioned, she tragically passed away in um, March of 2021 uh, after complications from breast cancer. She had a PhD from uh, University of York, obtained in 2006 uh, with prior degrees uh, from CIDE and UNAM from Mexico. She was uh, very prolific, starting with uh, her um, bachelor's um, work thesis that you can see here in 1995. She had very, very many papers, more than 50 published um, scientific papers in the literature with um, over 1,800 citations, uh, working in, in many aspects of, of health economics. She was a researcher at the Division of Health Economics at the National Institute of Public Health, a director of the master's degree in health economics with uh, academic expertise in health systems, impact evaluation, health and behavioral economics, collaborated in many national level research projects uh, evaluating impact of social programs, including Oportunidades Progresas, Seguro Popular, and had many interesting, innovative ways of analyzing equity effects, welfare effects, uh, health service access, and coverage. As mentioned, she published many papers, uh, in particular around incentives for HIV prevention and treatment in some of the top journals in health economics and also in most recently, reviews of, of uh, Oxford Handbook of Economics of Prostitution and the Oxford Encyclopedia of Health Economics. But since I was asked to pick one thing that has influenced us the most, I, I picked one of her first articles, um, Sex Work in Mexico, Vulnerability of Male Travestis, trans Transgender and Transsexual Sex Workers, because I remember her working in 2006, 2007, as she was pregnant interviewing the male sex workers at very high risk of contracting HIV and how that changed our views. As health economists, we did not necessarily know how to talk to people, but she did. And she showed us the importance of, of listening to, to the, what we call the key populations. And that we have translated, of course, into or have learned to do discrete choice experiments and other methods, quantitative methods. But her intuition was that that was the right thing to do. And that was uh, one of the things that has influenced me personally the most, and I think has influenced many in the field. I could go on, uh, but uh, in the interest of time, I will stop there. Uh, University of York has published uh, um, a note. Uh, IHEA, our special intersection, published a note, and many uh, friends and colleagues uh, have uh, done also um, a service because we will miss her uh, dearly. and. Um, she would want us to go on. So let us go on with uh, trying to do uh, good research that is in the interest of, of um, having a better world. Thank you. Thank you, Omar. That was very touching and, and really um, good to make sure that she's still present with us despite not, not being able to be here. Thank you. Uh, Linda, you are up. Thank you very much. Um, I'm presenting on costs associated with HIV um, testing and treatment initiation in a class randomized trial in Malawi. Um, globally, there are 38 million people living with HIV with approximately 55% of them in the Eastern and Southern African region. Malawi has um, about 1.1 million people living with HIV and in 2019 alone reported 13,000 new HIV infections. 
um, units set what are known as the 95-95-95 targets that aim that by um, 2030, 95% of all people living with HIV should be aware of the status and 95% of them should be on treatment. And um, 95 of people on treatment should have achieved viral load suppression. Malawi has been making progress towards this target, but um, despite such impressive progress, the country still lags behind in testing men. HIV testing is important uh, because uh, it acts as an entry point to prevention and treatment. Um, in general, men tend to have um, less opportunities for testing for HIV, they face additional um, social, cultural, economic, systematic um, barriers, as well as they do incur um, on average higher user costs than women. Um, so that makes men less likely to test and therefore making them more likely to develop, to develop advanced disease. Uh, literature on testing has shown us that uh, barriers to testing can be overcome by offering small cash incentives, as well as reducing um, the distance as a barrier to access testing facilities. Um, today I'll be presenting findings on the impact of financial incentives on HIV testing and linkage to care in a cluster randomized trial. Um, the trial was re armed uh, with standard of care, uh, a standard of care arm, an HIV self testing only arm, and an HIV self testing plus incentive arm. The target population were men. Um, these were uh, partners of women attending at dental care, as well as sexual partners of newly identified HIV positive individuals. In the across all three arms, um, the partners. The newly identified HIV positive individuals and the pregnant women were given letters inviting their partners to visit the clinic um, for um, an HIV test. However, in the intervention arm, um, they were given a letter plus an, an HIV self test kit for their partners to test themselves at home. Um, in the HIV self testing only arm, um, the partners were encouraged to return to the clinic only if they screened positive, while in the incentive arm, um, they were encouraged to return to the clinic or to come to the clinic regardless of their self-screening um, result or self-test result. And when they came to the clinic, they were given a $10 incentive. Um, for the costing, we estimated costs from a provider's perspective. Uh, we combined bottom-up, so we, we conducted an ingredient-based costing that combined bottom-up and bot, um, top-down cost analysis, and all costing was done between 2018 and 2019, and reported in 2019 US dollars. Um, the standard of care and HIV self-testing on the arm recruited similar number of people, uh, 1,600, while the incentive arm recruited 1,900 um, participants. 36% um, of the partners, um, as reported by the, by the pregnant women and the um, HIV, newly identified HIV individuals, 36% of the partners reported to have tested in the standard of care arm against 75% in the HIV self-testing only arm and 66% um, in the incentive arm. Of the 36% in standard of care, 15% of them um, went ahead the next step to confirm for confirmatory testing after um, screening positive, and there was a 1% positivity rate. This was against 2% um, in the self-testing on the arm and 1% uh, positivity rate. In the incentive arm, um, the 59% of them that were actually tested um, were confirmed for both after screening positive as well as a part of um, um, as this, a study, the study element that was trying to assess if they were able to accurately interpret results. And in the incentive arm, they ended up with the 3% positivity rate. Costs um, per kit distributed and later for the standard of care, the costs were comparable between the incentive arm, both um, $8.44 and $8.85, with cost of test kits and personnel as the key cost drivers. While well, costs in standard of care were half that of the, um, of the intervention arms. 
when we looked at cost per partner tested, um, just to say that cost per kid distributed excluded incentives, but at, when we're looking at cost per partner tested and included incentives, now the cost in the incentive um, um, was at almost $30, $29.6, with the cost in standard of care and uh, the HIV self-testing only um, comparable um, with the HIV self-testing only um, slightly lower. However, when we looked at cost per positive identified, um, the costs were comparable now between the standard of care and the incentive um, with the cost in the HIV self testing only um, actually um, way higher than the two arms. We then looked at the cost, the incremental cost over and above standard of care. Um, so I'd like to draw your attention to the, um, the numbers. Um, so to, if you if you look at the numbers, um, the incremental number of people reported testing were actually comparable in the um, intervention arm, both with um, above 600. However, um, the cost, this is our incremental cost per um, over and above standard of care, it was slightly cheaper in the HIV self-testing on the arm. But now to identify, when we looked at HIV positive identified, there's quite a big difference um, between the intervention arms with only um, two more people identified as positive in the HIV self-testing only arm against 43 in the incentive arm. And if I draw your attention to the costs, the costs are actually very different as well. So incrementally, it costs it costed $700 to identify an HIV positive person over and above standard care against 3,000 um, in the HIV self-testing only arm. Um, this is a good example of um, um, the role or the impact of um, incentives in um, identifying HIV self-testing on the, oh, sorry, identifying HIV um, positive individuals. Um, the key messages are that um, not just work in identifying HIV positive individuals as shown, such that despite a higher proportion of people reported to are actually have tested, um, in the HIV self-testing on um, it, we're actually able to identify um, a higher proportion as HIV positive in the incentive arm. Um, financial incentives applied in self-sampling um, technologies have the potential uh, um, to encourage linkage to follow-on care as demonstrated here. And um, the financial incentives used in this study um, had an additional advantage of compensating for cost of seeking care for individuals with high opportunity costs. Thank you. That's really great, Linda. Thank you so much for sharing. We'll move straight on. Uh, any questions can come in the chat box and then we'll present them at the end. Okay, so Colin. Colin is going to present on human-centered design to um, to encourage men to go for male circumcision. Thank you, Colin. Thank you, Fen. Um, are you able to see my, my screen? Are you able to see my screen? Yeah, see it. Okay, okay, great. Um, thank you. Um, just to say if, um, Pardon me if um, there's a dog barking in the background. My dog uh, tends to get excitable. Um, so I'm going to present uh, on a study that we did to assess um, relative efficiency of demand creation strategies um, to increase uh, VMMC uptake, um, uh, which is a study we conducted as part of a, a cluster randomized trial uh, in Zimbabwe. Uh, just to say um, this work is part of a, a supplement that's going to be published um, between now and between today and tomorrow. Um, VMMC is, is key for HIV prevention. It is also cost effective um, when provided to at risk uh, males, uh, 15 to 49. Um, however, uh, men, uh, adult men that are at greater, greatest risk of HIV remain hard to reach um, uh, in comparison to adolescent boys. Um, so this is due to a number of uh, supply side and demand side um, factors. Uh, on the supply side, um, there's a shortage of service delivery size, shortages of um, VMMC trained healthcare workers and staff attrition. Um, on the demand side, there's poor HIV risk perception. 
and health seeking among men, um, and then a range of fears, pain, uh, HIV testing, lengthy healing, and sexual abstinence, uh, opportunity costs, including transport and productivity losses. Um, Zimbabwe is one country that is uh, hardest hit by HIV. Um, prevalence 11.9 uh, in 2020, uh, 22 deaths. Um, modeling had suggested that uh, if 1.3 million um, men were circumcised by 2017, it could yield the greatest reduction in new infections. But by uh, December 2016, only 842,000 men um, had uh, um, at higher risk had um, um, been uh, circumcised. Um, with the higher risk men aged between 20 and 29 remaining elusive. Um, even by December 2017, um, 1.1 million, um, which is 89% of men um, had been circumcised, are uh, still below target. So um, the original program scale up uh, phase uh, was revised to 2021 uh, in order to achieve that uh, innovative, uh, robust, and cost effective demand creation strategies. Uh, are required to reach desired scale uh, and reach men over 20 years to optimize impact of VMMC on HIV incidence. PSI Zimbabwe, in conjunction with the um, Ministry of Health, um, designed their demand creation um, strategy based on market research and human-centered design methods. Um, a four-armed uh, class randomized trial um, evaluated human-centered design plus off of HIV self-test kit to motivate men uh, to take up VMMC using VMMC mobilizers or uh, interpersonal communications agents. Um, our study estimated the cost of VMMC uh, uh, together with demand creation. Uh, as a baseline, we estimated the cost of VMMC in three uh, service delivery models, which I'll uh, venture into a little bit later. Uh, we then estimated the additional cost of demand creation as an add-on to uh, one of the VMMC service delivery models. Um, so on this table, um, we see three, the three um, uh, VMMC service delivery models. Um, uh, VMMC was provided by public sector trained and remunerated uh, healthcare workers um, whose um, um, incomes were supplemented by program incentives. Um, so the first one is uh, the static site, which is um, based at district uh, hospitals, um, which provided continuous um, uh, service. Uh, to uh, working clients. And then the second one was an integrated mobile health facility, um, which provided intermittent services on specific days. And um, these facilities were undergoing uh, capacity um, um, capacitation towards eventual full VMMC status. And then the third one was mobile outreach um, health facilities, which provided intermittent services uh, and where teams from the district hospital would come to provide services where the uh, recruited numbers justified. Um, in terms of the uh, uh, randomized controlled trial, um, it was a four armed class randomized trial, um, as I've alluded uh, before. Um, and then this was conducted in five districts, um, and the arms were standard demand creation, uh, arm two standard demand creation plus offer of HIV self test kit, and arm three. Um, um, I was at uh, the HCDR approach, and then um, ARM4, um, uh, human-centered design, um, sorry, HCD is human-centered design. So ARM4 was human-centered design plus the offer of uh, HIV self-test kit. And as you can see, uh, the different ARMs had uh, different features. Um, they all had uh, uh, training on VMC mobilization for IPC agents, uh, and then mobilization in, as individuals or groups. Um, but where they differed was um, the offer of uh, training in um, uh, human centered design informed approach and also demonstration and use um, or distribution of HIV self test kits. We conducted a full economic costing uh, from the provider perspective. Uh, our baseline VMMC service delivery costing was from January to March 2018, um, and for the demand creation from May to October uh, 2018, which was in line with, um, uh, with, the, with the trial itself. Um, we conducted financial expenditure analysis by input type uh, and also micro costing at the health facility level uh, across 15 sites. Um, um, our analysis is um, in, in terms of uh, total program costs, uh, which constitutes demand creation plus service delivery. Uh, we estimated costs per client reached and per, and per client circumcised. We also conducted further analysis where we assessed unit cost and scale. 
um, uh, for service delivery, and then also changes in unit costs uh, per client second size when we combine demand creation and VMC service delivery. Uh, also assessing uh, influence of uh, service delivery characteristics such as type of facility, urbanicity, ownership, uh, whether uh, privately run by the church or uh, public sector run, um, and also in terms of annual number of clients served. Our course uh, in 2018 United States dollars. On this um, slide, we show results from the baseline costing uh, across the three model, static model, outreach, and uh, integrated. Um, um, and so the cheaper model uh, was the static model. Um, we see evidence of economies of scale is uh, uh, sites offering uh, more services tended to have uh, a lower cost. Uh, on this slide, um, this is the combined cost of uh, demand creation and um, uh, service delivery. Um, and um, um, as you can see, the, the human-centered uh, design approach uh, ARM3 is the one which had um, the lowest cost versus uh, the ARM with the ARM4 um, with the addition of uh, HIV self um, uh, testing. Uh, on this slide, we show the cost for demand creation uh, and service delivery when we um, assessed influence of uh, uh, site level characteristics, um, such as a type of uh, health facility, public or private ownership, uh, and also high and low um, uh, volumes. Um, costs were lowest um, in high volume privately run church clinics um, and highest in the low volume public sector clinics for the standard um, demand creation arm. Uh, within the standard demand creation arm, um, unit cost ranged uh, from 153 in the high, high volume privately run uh, uh, hospitals to 288 in low volume public sector clinics. Um, so standard demand creation, had, uh, the arm um, with standard demand creation the highest unit cost of all the four demand creation approaches. Um, the lowest costs were seen in um, human-centered uh, design plus HIVST model. Um, with a range of 87 in raw high volume privately run clinics to 141 in the low volume public sector run clinics. So uh, as uh, findings and conclusions, we see variability in unit costs across arms, um, which are with, uh, lowest, highest in the HCD plus HIV STR and lowest in the um, human center design arm uh, followed by standard demand creation. This cost variation suggests possible efficiency gains in VMMC service delivery across the various platforms. Um, um, also, uh, so so as a way of uh, uh, by way of conclusion, um, we say demand creation activities need to be intensified um, in order to achieve optimal utilization of um, inputs. Uh, standard demand creation um, and uh, VMMC standard design arms. Uh, provide greater scope for efficiency by spreading costs on higher numbers of clients reached and uh, uh, circumcised. Um, just to thank uh, all of the contributors to this work um, from the different institutions um, and the Billion Melinda Gates Foundation for uh, funding the study. Thank you. Thank you so much, Colin. That was really great. Um, we're going to move on swiftly because we've gone a bit over time. Um, so thank you, Peach, for joining. Thanks a lot, Colin. We'll get you questions at the end. Um, Colin, if you can stop sharing screens, then uh, Peach can. And your time will start. Um, Very prompt. Right. Um, Very promptly. Thank you. Seven minutes. Ice cream? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so I will be presenting another um, trial on self-testing, specifically the um, results from an economic evaluation that we did within the trial on community-led delivery of HIV self-testing kits. Um, my uh, um, colleagues here have, have touched on this a bit, but um, just to provide a bit of context, um, in 2019, there were 1.7 million new infections globally, and uh, two-thirds of new cases uh, were based in Sub-Saharan Africa. 
And uh, regionally, approximately one fifth of people with HIV um, were undiagnosed. Um, most HIV services are provided by health facilities and uh, due to demand and supply side barriers, uptake of HIV testing and treatment can often be inequitable. Um, as Linda and Colin have mentioned, um, there's gaps among certain population subgroups, including uh, men, adolescents, and also older adults. So to address uh, some of these gaps, community HIV services, um, including both community-based and community-led strategies, um, have been shown to increase testing in some of the priority subgroups that we're um, interested in reaching, as well as to identify HIV-positive individuals at earlier stages of disease. So community participation in health programs can be conceptualized along a continuum um, of increasing community empowerment. And we define community empowerment as an action-oriented process in which socially excluded individuals or groups gain power over their lives in order to change their structural environment and improve their quality of life. Um, community empowerment interventions are often operationalized through a reflection um, action process, um, a pathway um, through which these uh, interventions are hypothesized to affect health outcomes is through changes in behavioral and social mediators, uh, including collective awareness, self-efficacy, and agency and social cohesion. Um, so for this study, we evaluated provision of HIV self-testing kits through a community-led approach. Uh, specifically, we evaluated the individual level costs and the effect on HIV case identification within a cluster randomized trial. The trial involved randomizing 30 communities in Mangochi District, Malawi to either the community-led self-testing intervention in addition to the standard of care uh, versus the standard of care alone. And the standard of care included HIV service provision through um, government health facilities. Um, so just kind of to contrast that with the previous uh, presentations, um, this means because of our comparator, we're not able to um, test our um, the kind of hypothesized behavioral effects um, as part of this study design. Um, since our comparator is facility-based testing. Um, and our outcome evaluation was um, done using a post-intervention survey. Um, the intervention consisted of multiple components, and this included uh, participatory workshops with community groups to plan a self-testing campaign, uh, training with community volunteers, and um, also material support um, was provided and that included volunteer gratuity um, that was provided by the project. And then um, the intervention culminated in a seven day self-testing campaign. Um, we, in terms of uh, data collection, uh, we estimated individual level provider costs based on average economic costs of the intervention and the standard of care. And we combined these average costs with um, reported HIV testing and self-testing events um, from the past year um, that were reported um, in the survey. And then our uh, individual level intervention effects on HIV case identification um, were also estimated from the survey. And um, we considered alternative definitions of the outcome, including um, just any HIV positive uh, test, a new positive test, and also um, a positive test, but not on ART. For um, the data analysis, we um, estimated the incremental cost for HIV positive um, from adjusted incremental costs and effects, which were analyzed using a cluster level analysis. And we also measured uncertainty around the estimate using two-stage non-parametric bootstrapping. Um, and also uh, we conducted one-way sensitivity analysis. 
In terms of uh, activity level costs, we found that the average cost of the intervention was $5.70 and the standard of care was $4.57 and um, test kits and personnel were the main contributing costs. Our post-intervention survey included approximately 8,000 participants. Um, most individual level characteristics were balanced by arm uh, with the exception of uh, the variables uh, highlighted there, um, which we adjusted for in our analysis. Um, so our, our main results show that the incremental costs were higher in the intervention arm and the control arm. And um, this shows that there is actually low substitution between HIV self-testing and standard HIV testing because there was um, substantial self-testing uptake among recently tested individuals. And this, is, um, this was especially the case among women. Um, in terms of incremental effects, the proportion of HIV positive cases identified were higher in the intervention arm than the control arm. Um, but when we went to go um, assess um, different outcomes, including um, HIV positive, but excluding those who were previously diagnosed or treated, um, we did not detect a measurable effect. Um, the incremental cost per HIV positive was uh, $324, um, but this ranged from $985 to $1,300 um, when we considered previous diagnosis or treatment. Um, and then we also compared um, our incremental cost per HIV positive to a threshold of $315, um, which has previously been used to assess the cost effectiveness of HIV diagnostics um, in Southern Africa. And we found that based on this threshold, um, the intervention showed low, low probability of being cost effective. Um, and then just to quickly summarize this, um, we found that the incremental cost for HIV positive was, um, as expected, highly sensitive to the effect estimate. Um, so in summary, um, the community-led intervention showed a low unit cost. Um, the provider costs were higher in the intervention arm than the control arm due to uptake among recently tested individuals. Um, we could try to minimize retesting by screening recently tested individuals, but equally targeted um, distribution could increase stigma and decrease the overall HIV uh, testing uptake. Um, we also found that the incremental cost per HIV positive varied based on the outcome definition and um, with and also that uh, HIV positive had a key to, um, was a key determinant in um, affecting uh, cost effectiveness. Um, and we could potentially modify the intervention um, by targeting areas with higher prevalence of undiagnosed HIV, um, but also have to consider that diminishing returns to HIV testing will um, continue to impact cost effectiveness. And also I've listed some limitations of our study here, um, one being that this is a trial-based economic evaluation. Um, and just to um, conclude and bring this back to our uh, conceptual framework, uh, we hypothesized that an intervention based on a community empowerment framework could increase uptake of HIV testing. Um, in this study, we found that the intervention was relatively low cost in terms of increasing testing uptake. Um, we did intervene at the group level, um, and this might have caused um, an increase um, in uptake overall, but um, this might not also be the most efficient in terms of targeting and identifying new HIV positives. And so these are the sort of trade-offs we need to consider between group and individual level intervention. Um, we also hypothesize that a context-driven design, peer influence, and enhanced self-efficacy and agency would be important pathways to impact. And um, I think we'll aim to assess these sort of outcomes with a, a mediation analysis um, to see how impactful they are along our, um, in terms of influencing our endpoints. And to acknowledge uh, my great colleagues, um, thank you. That was really nice, Peach. Um, and we are slightly going over. Everyone's gone over slightly by 50%. So Harsha, I'm, I'm sorry if we are tight on your side. Um, so we will move on quickly. Harsha, are you ready 
2%. Any questions, please put them in the chat box and then we can, we can bring them up um, at the end. We look forward to having discussion with you all. Thank you, Harsha, you're on. Thanks so much um, and hi everyone. I'm really pleased to have this chance to talk to you about the work I've uh, just completed in Kenya with my colleagues. Um, uh, both here at uh, Penn, uh, UNC, and uh, <clears throat> Impact Research and Development Organization in Kenya. Um, this paper that I'm presenting is joint work with Ruchi Mahadeshwar at Brown University and Kawango Agat um, at Impact Research and Development Organization. We're focusing here on a HIV self-testing intervention that is somewhat similar to those that we've heard described uh, in this session. Um, but the primary outcomes and the objectives of the paper are really going to be centered on the behavioral responses of the people who have access to HIV self-tests. So to uh, set the stage briefly, um, the, the study is taking place in Kenya, took place in Kenya, and uh, it's a setting in which uh, transactional sex is highly prevalent and is a key driver of HIV risk. And here, when, we, when I speak about transactional sex, we're talking about primarily age disparate sexual relationships that are transactional in nature. And one reason why this sort of transactional sex is associated with higher HIV risk is that there is a very well-known, uh, what, what we call a risk income trade-off that women face, which is to say that uh, in order to earn higher compensation, higher income from transactional sex, they have to take on more risk uh, be it through um, uh, sex with uh, older male partners or through unprotected sex. And this type of risk premium for unprotected sex, sex and this risk income trade-off has been documented in a number of different settings. HIV self-testing comes in here because it is, uh, as many people have recognized, an important part of the solution. Um, number one, it can facilitate testing and eventually ART use among men who are living with HIV. So that might reduce the risk faced by adolescent girls and young women as well. Uh, and then also from the women's perspective, it also has the potential to facilitate learning your male partner's HIV status and uh, may then facilitate safer sexual behavior. And it's really that question that the paper is focused on. The HIV testing intervention in this case is HIV self-testing, um, and specifically the intervention, which I'll describe in the next slide, um, is, uh, is, is promoting what we call secondary distribution of HIV self-tests by women who receive multiple HIV self-tests um, and are encouraged or have the opportunity to uh, provide or offer the self-test to their male partners. This is an approach that we've studied in, in previous um, um, uh, documented in previous papers. And in this specific uh, paper, we're going to focus on how access to multiple HIV self-tests affects the sexual behavior of, um, of women who, who, who have those HIV self-tests. And we're going to use data on um, uh, transactional sex encounters um, that, that were um, uh, documented or uh, on which we had collected information over the course of about 18 months. Tell you briefly about the randomized control trial and then move on to the results. I'm going to intentionally keep it very brief um, and I'm happy to, uh, to um, share the full paper with those of you who are interested. Um, and, and hopefully that will allow some time for questions. So uh, to zoom through the study, this is a cluster randomized control trial that we conducted in Western Kenya. Um, 66 pair matched clusters um, were randomized to an intervention or a comparison group. And in each cluster, there were about 30 women who were enrolled. And the women were um, at higher risk of uh, HIV infection uh, for the following reasons. Um, they were uh, primarily actually because they self-reported two or more partners in the past four weeks. And they were all HIV negative at the time of enrollment. Here's the intervention succinctly. Um, it, it was what we call sustained access to HIV self-test, which is to say that women in the intervention clusters received five HIV self-tests at the time of enrollment, and then they could receive more HIV self-tests on a three-monthly basis. And the idea here was to both facilitate uh, frequent testing among the women themselves, but also to facilitate male partner testing. 
And in the comparison clusters, it was a very, in some ways, a status quo approach, which is to say that women were simply encouraged to seek uh, facility-based testing and um, also to refer their male partners, more importantly, to seek facility-based testing. Um, uh, participant characteristics here, uh, by and large, the, the, the mean age was 27, the median age was about 24 years. Um, and uh, you see that about 65% of uh, study participants were, were married. Um, I wanna move on now to the core of this paper. So we're not gonna report the full results from the randomized control trial, but really focus on how knowledge about male partners HIV status affected sexual decision-making and transactional sex encounters. So the data, as I said, were, were, uh, are coming from 11,000 recent transactional sex encounters that study participants reported over time. Um, and we'll focus on what, uh, what effect the intervention had on learning partner status, um, on condom use, as well as compensation, or what we call prices associated with each encounter. Um, here's some salient features of the transactional sex encounters um, that were reported. On average, women reported 2.4 recent encounters per participant round. Um, and remember, they were followed up every six months for up to 24 months. So, uh, so we we're receiving data on multiple encounters over time. About 50% of the encounters were with older men. And here, we, when we talk about older men, this is relative to the participant. They were five or more years older. And relatively few of these encounters were what we call first-time encounters. So these were encounters with men that uh, the women had ongoing relationships with. The reduced form effects of the intervention, I think one headline result is in column one, which is to say that the intervention significantly increased the likelihood that women knew the status of the transactional sex partner. Um, so that's a 25 percentage point increase relative to um, about 40% in the control group. So a very sizable increase in knowledge about male partners HIV status. Second result is that women in the intervention group, because they had access to HIV self-test and could test their male partners, uh, they were twice as likely to say that there was a scenario in which a partner tested HIV positive or refused to accept an HIV test and as a result of that, they either used condoms or they declined to have sex altogether. So there's some amount of uh, well, quote unquote screening of male partners that's happening as a result of the intervention. So that's um, finding number two. Um, finding number three um, is the following. Um, we looked at these transactional sex encounters and we said, okay, well, if women, in the intervention group are able to learn the male partner status at much, much higher rates, what, is, what do they then do after they learn the male partner's HIV status? I told you in the previous slide that when the partner tested HIV positive or when they were unable to learn the male partner status, they tended to shift towards safer sexual behavior. Here we're focusing on what happens when they learn that the male partner is HIV negative. And in panel B, I want to draw your attention here because these are encounters reported by adolescent girls and young women, which are about half the study population. What you see here is that they're much less likely to use condoms with those partners that test HIV negative. And that's potentially a concerning result because uh, unprotected sex does carry, in this case, while it may not carry HIV risk, it may, it may carry other um, STI risk and pregnancy risk. Um, but Along with the decline in condom use, what we see in columns three and four is that they're reporting significantly higher income per encounter. So column four, where we adjust for a number of different controls, like demographic characteristics, et cetera, uh, we see that there's a 64% increase in income per encounter. So declining condom use, but higher compensation. Again, consistent with the risk income trade-off, but in this case, they're able to make uh, at least a, a safer, uh, they're engaged in, in safer behavior from the standpoint of HIV risk and they're getting more compensation as a result. Um, when we look overall, we take a step back and look at all study participants. Um, we see in column two that there is a significant increase in income from transactional sex in the intervention group. So women who had access to multiple HIV self-tests over time uh, report no change in overall monthly income, that's column one, 
But in column two, they do report a significant increase in income from transaction sex, about 11% increased. So I wanna conclude, um, and I realize this was a, a very rapid run through the results, but uh, what are the implications of sustained access to HIV self-tests among women at high risk of HIV infection? Um, consistent with some of my own prior studies, as well as other studies that have been reported even today, um, there's much higher awareness of male partner status and even identification of HIV positive partners as a result of having access to HIV self-test. So unambiguously there, you know, this intervention is facilitating learning male partner status. And from the men's standpoint, it's also facilitating increased knowledge about your own status. What it also does though, and this is what the paper is really pointing out, is that it seems to be eliminating the income risk trade-off that women face. So before, if women wanted to earn more income, they had to engage in unprotected sex, and they didn't know the status of that partner with whom they were engaging in unprotected sex. Here, what we're seeing is that when they do engage in unprotected sex, it's with partners whose status they have learned and who are HIV negative. So in other outcomes that we look at in the study, we, we point out that um, there's no effect on HIV incidence, so the, the intervention is not increasing, nor is it decreasing their HIV incidence, and self-reported STI risk and pregnancy risk is uh, not affected by the intervention either. So in addition to reducing risk with HIV positive partners, this, this intervention appears to be enabling women to earn more income from transactional sex without taking on more HIV risk. Uh, a, a somewhat surprising, unexpected finding, but consistent with, uh, with both theoretical rationale that we've, we've laid out in the paper, as well as some of the empirical evidence we have from other studies. Thanks to a number of collaborators who made this study possible, and I'll stop with that. Thank you, Harsha. That was really exciting and very consistent with some of Matt's work, eh? although yours was hypothetical. So it was nice to see it working out in, in practice. I'm handing over to you, Matt. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much. I'm really grateful to be invited to, to discuss uh, such interesting presentations. You know, sometimes you get uh, uh, sessions which don't have such a variety of high quality or interesting research to discuss. And this, is, this has been a really, uh, really interesting uh, 50 odd minutes so far. So uh, in the interest of time, we're going to make one point of, of each of the, the presented presentations. Then we're going to talk about four cross-cutting themes uh, and maybe something that uh, people can think about more. So uh, Linda showed us um, that twice as many people tested uh, with the HIV self-test nudge compared to standard care, but fewer people attended confirmatory testing. And there's a really interesting dynamic of getting more people to do something, but are they the right people? Um, the financial incentive arm had a much higher yield, I say much higher, 3% versus 1% or 2%. Um, I, I would question, you know, if a financial incentive is a nudge or not. I know it's quite contentious in the um, behavioral science field versus the behavioral economists about whether these things are uh, nudges if we're just paying people to do things. Um, Colin showed us that, that human-centered design doesn't necessarily lead to expensive interventions. I think that's a really valuable um, finding that we don't, we, we can listen to people, we can respond to what people want, um, placing patients, you know, at the heart of what we do, and it doesn't have to be prohibitively expensive. Um, Peach, uh, I think what I took away most out of Peach's presentation was this interesting targeting question. So particularly if your intervention reaches people who have most recently tested, um, you know, we can we can do things to make testing interventions in particular attractive, but it's really important who we are getting through the door um, to test. Harsha's uh, work, as Ben said, is, is quite related to things we've done in the hypothetical domain, which is really cool. Um, behavioral change with HIC HIV self-test use. So instead of looking at the effect of things on self-testing behaviours, it's the effect of self-testing on the behaviours. Um, one thing I'll note, Harsha, is you mentioned this is about sustained access to HIV self-tests. So whereas others were um, thinking perhaps about testing as a one-off behaviour, I think this is, it made me think of, um, we have these big events, research programmes in the UK about COVID at the moment, and lateral flow tests are being used as, um, you know, your passport if you're not vaccinated to get in. And the, the interesting dynamic about repeated exposure to an information 
access tool that, that can help you affect, you know, pick which behaviors you're willing to expose yourself to on different days. If I have um, a positive lateral flow test, I'm not going to go to Wembley and not, not just use the Laura, use lose the Euros. Um, you showed us uh, as well um, this kind of possibility of assortative mixing, which I think um, when we come to um, make better mathematical models which understand these behaviours, if people can um, pick, you know, the level of risk in a partnership that they want, they either pick the, the pick the partnership they want or pick the level of risk and they can calibrate that. Um, I think that's something we really, really need to understand. So that's a quick review of the, uh, the presentation. There are four, I think, cross-cutting themes across at least two or three. Um, the first is men. So Linda Collin and Peach are primarily focused on men. Men are obviously such a key uh, population about um, to get at testing. Um, and the second kind of cross-cutting theme is, is, is the first three presentations did some really good um, costing studies. So really robustly measured the cost associated with these different um, approaches. Um, one thing that I think <clears throat> the, the eight minute presentation scenario doesn't quite allow is context and standard of care, understanding what standard of care is, what exists in that, how we expect people in different, very different contexts to react to different changes to a very different standard of care. Um, it, it would be interesting to, to hear about that. The other um, thing I'd be interested to hear about is, is whether the insights that we get from either the self-test, the effect of things on self-test, can we look at the effect of interventions on other things, their generalizability in other areas of the HIV cascade? Um, or harsher, what else, what else may be affecting behaviors that we don't know about? So we did some hypothetical work about PrEP, but is there any other information, you know, times through that cascade where your information changes? Maybe it's around a new partnership formation or whether it's around um, sort of some other sort of care access. Um, what are the other areas that are going to be interesting to understand how people's behaviour change dynamically? Um, I'm going to finish there and hand back to you for, we've got two minutes to uh, open the floor up perhaps, but thank you very much for having me here. That was really, really a, a great discussion, Matt. Thanks for drawing across and drawing some of the broader lessons learned. It looks like most of the questions that have been asked have already been responded to. Um, there was one question that was uh, great on incentives. And Hannah, did you, did you want to pose that to Linda? And then it's probably the last one and we'll have to wrap up. Hannah, are you still with us? Hi, yes, I'm still here. I think my question was answered in the chat. Um, I was just asking about how the incentives were determined, how the amount of the incentive was determined, and if there was any thought about doing a sensitivity analysis to look at how the outcomes would change as the incentive threshold changes. Linda, did you want to have a quick response to that? Because it's um, something that we yeah, I, I answered the incentive bit. Um, the sensitivity analysis, I think it's something we can explore. Um, I have to have a think on the how, but um, when, when in the next phase of the week, um, thank you, that's um, something we'll add in the, in the sensitivity analysis. And Linda, one thing that you've, you've talked about is that in this case, anyone presenting to the facility was given a $10 incentive, whether they were negative or not. And so then there's a trade-off between uh, being more targeted, only suggesting to people with a positive test come for confirmatory testing, where you're nar narrowing your pool of incentives. But the flip side of that is it may increase um, stigma and reduce the number of people who present because of that is like self-identifying. So these are one of the interesting trade-offs between narrow targeting and being very efficient, but potentially uh, undermining your own intervention if you are too targeted. So this is definitely an area for future research. Thank you so much. There are a few more questions coming in, um, but I think we have now run out of time. Uh, Elaine, you had a last question. I'm not sure if we're allowed one last question from our from our hosts. Elaine, would you like to make your last question, and then we'll close up. 
Thanks so much. It was really interesting, everyone. Thank you so much for the panel um, presentations. Uh, my question, I think my question is for Hannah, um, but I was asking about this, this nudge versus incentive and how it's actually viewed by uh, the beneficiaries themselves. Like, is there, has there been any work on how providers and beneficiaries perceive these nudges or incentives? Over. Sorry, that's my question. Does anyone have a response for for um, for Elaine? And if not, that will be an area for future research. Uh, given given the two second rule of no response, we're going to close it up. I thank everyone for joining. Really great starting point for discussion, not an ending point. Please let's keep talking to each other, and I uh, look forward to to the rest of IHEA. Uh, I'd like to thank. Uh, my co-host Jason and all of you presenters. Thank you so much.